This is Eric from Stanford University, and today I'll be discussing hypertension with a focus on treatment thresholds and non-pharmacologic therapies. Today's learning objectives will be to describe considerations when setting the threshold at which antihypertensive therapy should be started for specific patients, and to describe the four major non-pharmacologic therapies for hypertension. Let me start by talking about how high a patient's blood pressure needs to get before one should recommend treatment, and once treatment's begun, what is the target blood pressure one should strive to achieve? In my opinion, one of the greatest errors in hypertension management is being too dogmatic about a specific cutoff for starting treatment. There's a consortium of hypertension experts in the US called the Joint National Committee, or JNC, who gather every five to 10 years to re-examine the scientific literature and update recommendations about the diagnosis and treatment of high blood pressure. Consider how their recommendations have changed over time. Let's start with the fifth meeting of JNC back in 1993. At that time, they recommended starting antihypertensive medication for all patients whose blood pressure was consistently above 140 over 90 after a three to six month trial period of lifestyle modifications. It didn't matter what age the patient was or what other conditions he or she had. If the blood pressure was 140 over 90 or higher, they should be on medications. Then four years later, the JNC6 recommendations came out. These were more liberal with the trial period of lifestyle changes but were stricter with the actual blood pressure goal for those with concurrent kidney disease or diabetes. JNC in 2003 made only a minimal change in the diastolic blood pressure goal for patients with diabetes or kidney disease. And finally, about six months ago, JNC 8 came out with yet another set of recommended thresholds, which is almost identical to those from 1993. With recommendations changing back and forth like this over time, it seems silly to strictly practice by them. And you might wonder what the source is of these changing recommendations. While one factor is obviously updated science, another is simply the turnover of the committee members making those recommendations. In fact, for the first time, a sizable minority of JNC8 published a dissenting opinion on hypertension management, highlighting significant internal disagreement within the final published report. Let's look at some other issues regarding specific treatment thresholds. First, while principles of treatment thresholds which seem logical when hypothesized, such as a lower blood pressure is always better than a higher blood pressure, they often fail to be proven when actually critically examined in large clinical trials. In addition, while observational studies may show an optimal blood pressure for a specific population, that is not the same as showing that the population benefits from receiving medication therapy to achieve that optimal pressure. It's likely that to some extent, Elevated blood pressure is simply a marker of other pathophysiologic derangements which are harder for us to identify, which are the primary contributor to increased cardiovascular risk. In addition, pharmacologic treatment for high blood pressure carries risk in itself, risk which probably increases with increasing age. For example, consider the following graph. This shows the hazard ratio for the combined endpoint of death, non-fatal heart attack, and non-fatal stroke as a function of blood pressure and age. The 22,000 patients included in this data set were given one of two antihypertensive combinations. Notably, there were no patients included in the study who had placebo. That is, every patient in this study was on at least two antihypertensive medications. As you can see, for the green line, which represents patients aged 50 to 60, the lower the systolic blood pressure the lower the risk of adverse outcome, all the way down to a pressure of 120. However, the older the patients, the less well they did with low blood pressures. And in fact, in the oldest group of patients, 80 and above, they appeared to do the best when their average systolic blood pressure was about 140. This would imply that a best target blood pressure in this group isn't less than 140, but rather 140 exactly, or more broadly, a range between 130 and 150. Lower is not always better, at least among patients who are actively receiving pharmacologic therapy. In summary, treatment thresholds should be individualized and take into account age, as we just saw. Life expectancy. Since the benefit of good blood pressure control takes years to be seen, 
but side effects can be immediate. In patients with limited life expectancy from conditions such as cancer or advanced dementia, a much higher threshold is appropriate. Additional risk factors for cardiovascular disease. The greater one's cumulative risk is, the more he or she should do to mitigate it as much as possible. Also, since many antihypertensives have benefit that extends beyond the control of hypertension, patients can improve their benefit to risk ratio by careful selection of medication. Evidence of current end organ dysfunction from inadequately controlled hypertension might suggest a patient is, for whatever reason, more susceptible to harm from high blood pressure, necessitating a lower threshold and or goal. For example, the findings of hypertensive retinopathy in a patient would almost certainly lead me to target lower blood pressures than otherwise. Contraindications to treatment, which can include concerns over polypharmacy or orthostatic hypotension. The combination of supine hypertension and orthostatic hypotension is a major problem in some elderly patients and almost always requires targeting a higher blood pressure. And finally, patient preference. Some patients feel very strongly about not wanting to take medications and may be willing to accept an increased risk of adverse cardiovascular outcomes in exchange. In my experience, most patients who fall into this category don't seem to truly understand analysis of risk and benefit or don't f truly appreciate how devastating these outcomes can be, such as a stroke, blindness, or dialysis-dependent kidney failure. Nonetheless, patient preference should still be a consideration. The final point I'd like to make about treatment threshold is that most, if not all, recent professional guidelines currently recommend antihypertensive medication for all non-elderly patients, including those who are otherwise low risk, who have stage 1 hypertension. However, there are no clinical trials demonstrating either reduction in adverse cardiovascular outcomes or mortality benefit in low risk patients with stage 1 hypertension. As a consequence, some clinicians are no longer convinced about the need to aggressively treat stage 1 hypertension with medications in patients with no other cardiovascular risk factors. However, irrespective of opinion on medications regarding these patients, they should still be advised of lifestyle modifications. Moving on to treatment, it usually requires a multifaceted approach. First, there is non-pharmacologic therapy, often referred to as lifestyle modifications. Then there are medications. And finally, correction of any cause of secondary hypertension. The rest of this video will focus on the non-pharmacologic therapies. First, and possibly most important, is weight loss. It doesn't need to be a dramatic 50 pound loss, but it also can't be trivial. I usually recommend focusing on 10 pounds first, or 20 pounds for patients who seem unusually motivated. What's more important than losing a large amount of weight is establishing a new approach to eating that will allow the weight loss to be sustainable in the long run. Losing 30 or 40 pounds for a few months and then gaining it all back will certainly not be as helpful in keeping away adverse cardiovascular outcomes as losing 10 or 20 pounds and keeping it off. The next modification is a low sodium diet. So what exactly is meant by a low sodium diet? It's defined by most experts as about two grams of sodium per day for most people, which is about six grams of sodium chloride, also known as table salt. Now the majority of salt in our food is added during food processing and is neither an original intrinsic component of the food, nor is it added to the food with a salt shaker in the home just before consumption. Therefore, the most effective way to reduce dietary sodium intake is to reduce consumption of processed foods. As just one of countless possible examples, I found this in my freezer. Uh, these are vegetarian corn dogs from Trader Joe's. Now that might seem pretty healthy, and it only does, uh, it does only have 160 calories, but into the 160 calories is packed 510 milligrams of sodium. However, that's nothing compared to this can of, of uh, rich and hearty chicken and home-style noodles, which comes with an amazing 1,380 milligrams of sodium. Here in the States, it's common for corporations to, mass, uh, to market mass-produce ready-made meals using phrases such as heart smart or heart healthy.
But unfortunately, these are near meaningless terms. And don't get me started on the food industry terms sodium-free versus low sodium versus reduced sodium versus light and sodium. Not one person in a thousand likely knows the varied definitions of these. I certainly can't remember them. And I just saw these crackers in my, uh, in my pantry, which are labeled a hint of salt. Um, what in the world does a hint of salt mean? I, I really have no idea. Finally, the packaging may be overtly de deceptive by providing information for a smaller serving size and simply increasing the number of servings per container. For example, here is a bag of healthy appearing baked pita chips um, labeled, quote, simply naked, implying minimal additives. Now, this is a pretty hefty bag that most people would not consider consuming in one sitting, but it's not inconceivable that a single individual could consume a bag, him or herself, over the course of, let's say, a movie or a football game. And if that person was wondering how much sodium was just ingested, he or she might look at the nutrition label and see that, hey, there's only 270 milligrams per serving. That doesn't seem so bad. But unfortunately, into this bag, there's eight servings. So by consuming one admittedly large bag of healthy looking baked pita chips, you've consumed an entire day's worth of sodium. The bottom line with processed foods and sodium intake is that although science has not yet established that there is something intrinsically less healthy with processed foods in regards to most of their great number of unpronounceable ingredients, there is a significant downside to the generally high sodium content. If a person wants to consume less sodium in his or her diet overall, the simplest strategy is a reduced consumption of processed foods. Another important lifestyle modification is regular exercise. Although there is a common belief that the exercise must be aerobic in nature, such as jogging, riding a bicycle, or swimming, in fact, lifting weights has also been shown to lower blood pressure. Provided that a patient has no major contraindications to either, I recommend a combination of both aerobic exercise and modest weight training. Finally, for patients who consume excessive amounts of alcohol, reducing their alcohol consumption will improve blood pressure. Now, the effect of alcohol on cardiovascular endpoints, such as heart failure, heart attacks, and stroke, is very complicated, since modest alcohol intake may actually improve atherosclerosis and the cholesterol profile. The sweet spot, that is the optimal amount of alcohol intake, appears to be about one conventionally sized drink per day. This recommendation doesn't necessarily apply to everyone, for example, if heart failure has already developed, complete abstention from alcohol is probably best since alcohol is toxic to cardiac myocytes. And for anyone who has developed uh, alcohol-related gastrointestinal disease, such as stomach ulcers or liver failure, complete alcohol abstention is essential. But for most adults, reducing consumption down to one daily drink is a good idea. For those adults who currently don't drink any alcohol at all, do I recommend starting? Uh, not usually, since the benefit of one drink a day is probably smaller than the risk of unmasking a predisposition to alcohol abuse. In addition, there are many millions of people around the world who abstain from alcohol due to religious beliefs. The medical benefit of modest alcohol is certainly not enough to sacrifice one's religious convictions. However, the average adult should not feel guilty, at least not from a medical perspective, in consuming one daily drink. So that's the four big lifestyle modifications to consider in hypertensive patients. Uh, lose weight, eat less salt, exercise regularly, and reduce alcohol consumption down to one drink daily. Each one of these components, if the patient is successful at adhering to them, will reduce systolic blood pressure on average by about five points and diastolic blood pressure by about three as a very, very rough estimate. For obese patients able to lose 25 pounds or more, they may experience even greater amounts of weight loss. The bottom line is for most people, employing only one modification won't necessarily lead to obvious improvement in blood pressure. But since the effects are additive, doing all four could drop a person's blood pressure by as much as 20 points or more, which can definitely be the difference between needing medications and not needing them.
In addition to these four, there are certainly other modifications to consider. The big one additional modification is smoking cessation. I don't consider smoking to be one of the big four antihypertensive uh, modifications because most of the benefit from smoking cessation is probably due to a reduction in smoking's con contribution to atherosclerosis that is independent of its effect directly on blood pressure. And of course, there's also the benefit of smoking cessation on dramatically reducing the risk of numerous cancers and COPD or emphysema. Other changes to consider include avoidance of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents such as ibuprofen and naproxen, as these can lead to salt and water retention in the kidneys. Also, there is limited evidence that high potassium diets may be helpful at reducing blood pressure uh, intentionally, uh, but intentionally increasing potassium intake should be considered only in consultation with a physician, as potential contraindications to this include kidney disease, as well as the use of some medications predisposing to hyperkalemia, uh, that is high potassium, such as ACE inhibitors, angiotensin II receptor blockers, and aldosterone antagonists. So that concludes this video on hypertension treatment thresholds and non-pharmacologic therapy. But the next video in this series on hypertension will cover antihypertensive medications. 